All right, we're <clears throat> going to give a shout out. Alton's not here this morning either. He's with his mother in Marion, he had told us yesterday. And a shout out this to Tyler and Alton. They did a lot of work yesterday while we were down having our Mother's Day thing. And again, thankful for the ones that uh, were able to help with there, all the men that cooked and participated and stuff. But we've got a uh, new technology we're testing today. So hopefully it will all work. <laughs> Uh, did a lot of work yesterday running cables and getting things set up. So we, um, let's see if I can make it work now. <clears throat> so, because uh, we not be, I won't use our clicker anymore. We can actually control the screen from our iPad. So this is going to be a little bit different for me because I'm so used to, you know, clicking. So uh, this is our first Corinthians class 11. And um, going back to our mantra here. Um, <clears throat> Acts 17, 11, hopefully you've come here with readiness of mind and you have and been searching scriptures of what we've been talking about. As Marshall mentioned, um, you know, Corinthians has been tough with chapter 5 was hard, chapter 6 is hard, chapter 7 is hard, chapter 8 has been hard. We're going to look at chapter 9 today. This is a lot quite as difficult, but there is some things in there that... Um, can be maybe challenging or difficult. But I want to go back and look at Corinthians 8, 11 through 13. I had some thoughts on this after class. Um, and I just want to touch on this and, re, and re, go over this again just a little bit. And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, you will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. And we talked about Paul, and you know, this was the law of brotherly love. And we talked about how Paul, he's going to get into 13, which I hopefully we, I don't know if we'll make it that far. But, <clears throat> you know, he's talking about we've got to love our brother enough that we're willing to forego personal pleasure or even if it's lawful it, to eat the meat he's, he's using this example but I can use you can use this for any example um, in order to save their soul and not sin against Christ you know and I mentioned this do all in the name of the Lord you know can we whatever we do in word or deed do all in the name of the Lord giving thanks to God the Father through him we have got to remember everything we do has to be done for the glory of God. Um, and I mentioned, what did Jesus say a soul was worth? And I tried to quote Matthew 26, I mean Matthew 16, 26. I didn't do a good job. I kind of fuddled that a little bit. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for a soul? You know, what God thought a soul, a single soul, was worth more than the whole world. And we lose perspective on that sometimes. We forget what a soul is worth to God. And we get so trapped in the world, I think, that, you know, we're on this hamster wheel, we're trying to do better. I was talking, I, I was talking to a gentleman yesterday, and I, I, I'm like, how in the world he did this, I don't know, but he said he was working four jobs out of high school. He only slept on Tuesdays. I can't even comprehend only sleeping one day a week and working four jobs, just one to another to another. But he said between, I forgot, no dose and caffeine and all these different things that kept him going until he thought he was going to have a heart attack. And this is a young man, you know, obviously out of high school, he said at that time, and he said the boss told him, I'm either going to fire you or you're going to quit. And he said, I quit all four jobs that day because I thought I was going to die. Because, we, you know, he was trying to get ahead, chase the dollar. How many, you know, and I told him, I said, you know, I remember as a young man, I work 80 hours a week. I didn't think anything about it because I was trying to get ahead. You know, I thought that's what I needed to do. But as we get older, we learn. We, that is not what we're designed to do. We've got to be putting God first in things. 
Some verses that came to mind I want to talk about. You know, this is Jesus speaking. He says, take heed for yourself. If your brother, again, he is talking to the Jews at this time. So they're all brothers, they're all family, you know, in the Jewish family. Sins against you. Rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and seven times a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. You know, this is a command. And again, he's talking to the Jews here, but I think that it relates to the church. Because we have to be forgiving of our brothers and sisters. If we're going to be in heaven with them, we've got to be loving, kind, and gentle here on this earth. You know, Matthew 18, 15 tells you how to properly deal with a brother that sins against you. I can't tell you how many times this eldership, people come to us and they say, so-and-so did such-and-such, -and, and we ask them, have you gone and talked to them? Nine out of ten times, the answer is no. I'm like, you don't need to be coming talking to us. You need to go talk to that brother. Uh, again, yesterday, I had a, a person, trying not to use gender here, so you know, I had a person that I just had some bad vibes from here at the congregation for the last week or so. And yesterday, I called him and I said, hey, did I do something to offend you? Because I just feel like, you know, you're not as friendly. You're not talking to me. There's something going on that if I did, I didn't mean to. You know, I love you. I want, you know, all I want to do is help. And they said, no, it's not you. It's all, and started giving me all these other things. You know, we had a good conversation about it. But when somebody, if you feel awkward, go talk to that person is what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to do what the Bible says do, and I hope you are too. Um, John, 1 John 4.20 again the apostle of love here says if somebody says I love God and hates his brother he is a liar for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen how can he love God who he has not seen and this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also notice that's a commandment from God now this is obviously talking about Christians and Christians brothers and I mentioned this verse before, but we have to love each other. We are all going to go to heaven together. Matthew 5, 44, this is Jesus speaking again. He says, but I say to you, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now, this is what Jesus says of enemies. Notice, love, bless, do good, and pray. And this is some of the conversation I had in my head after last week and before this week. And I, I know the family of Charles Clark misses Charles, but I miss Charles. You don't know how many times I'd call Charles on the phone and talk to him. I got a question, counsel with him. Um, and this kind of some stuff that came to mind, I guess because at the end of chapter 9, when we're going to talk about once saved, always saved a little bit, um, I remember having a conversation with him sitting in Forest City in the back of a van because I was having a conversation with the gentleman and he was giving me all these scriptures to look at. But Charles and I had a conversation about this one time. Love, bless, do good, and pray. And this is to our enemies. How much more should we do to our brothers? And Paul reiterates that in Romans 12, 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. You know, how much more should we love our brothers and sisters in Christ? You know, what if Jesus said, but I say to you, love the brethren. Bless the brethren who speak ill of you. Do good to the brethren who hurt your feelings. And pray for the brethren who spitefully wrong you or pester you. Because that's usually what we get when, you know, think about this. I mean, it's kind of funny. But if we're supposed to do that to our enemies, think about our brothers, our sisters. Because usually, this is what it is. It's hurt feelings. It's somebody is annoying me. You know, we have to be careful with this. And this is my synopsis of a conversation I had with Charles. He says, you cannot forgive a person who has wronged you until you can pray for God to bless that person. This isn't exactly the words, but this is what my takeaway was from that. I want to ask you something. If somebody's wronged you, 
Can you pray for them to, for God to bless them? And I'm going to tell you, it's hard. Again, I mentioned last week, and Tim told me after class, he said, the truth is hard. This is hard. You know, when you, I'm not saying, Lord bless them. That's not having the right attitude, is it? No, I'm saying you've got to pray the Lord will bless that person and pray he will help you forgive that person for whatever that wrong was. Again, this is hard. And these are some thoughts I had after that and this conversation with Charles came into my head. And I wanted to share this with you because this is important. We are going to be in heaven together. I hope our goal is to go to heaven. We've got to love each other. We've got to forgive each other. We've got to pray the Lord will bless each other. All right, now I said all that to get into class. <laughs> Chapter 9, verse 1. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? Paul was an apostle, but it's hard to believe some denied his apostleship there at Corinth. Paul dates his apostleship, notice, from... Acts 9, when he saw the Lord. And this is, you know, this is important. Um, Brother Kaufman said, it is important to see that in this short paragraph, the impossibility of any man being a true apostle unless he has seen Jesus Christ our Lord after his resurrection, thus being an eyewitness of the resurrection. And Paul, you know, <clears throat> if I am not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. He is saying, even if others doubt I'm an apostle, surely you cannot doubt because of the work I've done with you. Remember, he was there for 18 months. He gave them the gift of the Holy Spirit so they could do miracles. Obviously, they saw him doing miracles. So how could they deny this? And part of the reason was... You know, he didn't take a salary. He wouldn't take pay. And we're going to talk about this here. Why defense to those who examined me is this. My defense. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? And again, he's trying to, he's proven his apostleship. He now explains his right to receive support by those whom he has labored. Because he would not accept support for his labors, but work with his own hands to support himself, some believed he knew he was not a true apostle chosen of Jesus Christ. Do we right to take along a believing wife, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas. This is an interesting verse. You know, I don't remember ever really studying this verse before, but does this prove the brothers of Jesus, who we see in Matthew 13, 55, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, were married? It sure sounds that way, doesn't it? Now, James and Judas, we have the two books, and we know they were converted after the resurrection. There's no, you know, I don't know about Simon and Joseph, but if he's talking about all the brothers of the Lord or not in that case. But does this prove that Cephas, another name for Peter, was married? Well, we know Peter was married because in Matthew 8, 14, you see Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. He wouldn't have a mother-in-law without a wife. But this goes to... Those who teach against the clergy or preachers being married should consider this passage because if the apostles of Jesus were married, may not the preachers of today follow their example. It's also an interesting, again, I mentioned last week about things you've heard in the Bible or things you believe were in the Bible that weren't not, were really not in the Bible. Um, we talked about that, but you know, a lot of people believe the teaching of men. Teaching of men today, you know, there's a whole big sect that believe the clergy cannot marry. They must be married to the Lord, must be celibate. Then you've got the um, Peter being the first uh, pope, you know, obviously he was married. Then you've got the perpetual virginity of Mary that they teach. Obviously this cannot be true. He... The brothers of the Lord, and it also says that in Matthew 8, 14. These, you know, they want to say, well, this was another wife. It wasn't Mary. These were, or these were cousins. They want to, you know, twist the scriptures around for their doctrine that is not correct. So we have to be careful in speaking the truth where the, Lord, where the Bible speaks the truth. 
Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Now, this is the only mention of Barnabas, Barnabas being with Paul since their disagreement, which was on the second missionary journey in Acts 15, where they had the disagreement over John Mark. And Barnabas wanted him to come. Paul didn't because he didn't stay the course as a young man on the first missionary journey. So they split and went their ways. I want us to notice from this, obviously that contention was not over doctrinal issues. We can, this, you know, it's so sad in our society today. We can't disagree with people and we can't have debates anymore in our society without like severing all ties. We should be able to disagree in non-doctrinal issues and still remain friends. I mean, but it appears our society won't let us do that today. And that's such a sad thing. And same way with debating with people. Um, obviously, they had this disagreement. They both went their ways. They both continued the work. But obviously, he mentions them here. So there were some... They, did not sever the relationship, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And literally what he's saying here is we have no authority to not work at a secular job. But Paul argues that he had as much right to these things, a wife and support, as Peter, the brothers of the Lord, and the rest of the apostles. Whoever goes to war at his own expense, whoever plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, and who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock. You know, he's being rhetorical here. Um, but he, you know, I've, we've got a blueberry bush at the birth center. I was noticing all, how full it was this year. You know, we're going to eat of the blueberries. You know, I know uh, the pies, you know, got goats. I don't know if they milk those goats or not, but they do, I'm sure. Not this pie. <laughs> oh, not yet. So, um, but, you know, the, obviously, if you're going to drink the milk of the flock, you know, and it's interesting, a preacher is often compared to a soldier. He goes forth and contends with the world, a bind dresser or a farmer. He plants congregations or a shepherd. He feeds Christians from God's word. But he's being rhetorical in this statement here. Do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same also? You know, Paul's question is, am I speaking as only a man without God's authority? He had God's authority. He was an apostle. He doesn't limit himself to illustrations from human affairs. He always appeals to the scripture. And we're going to see that in just a minute as he goes back to the law. But Paul go, and it's going to go to the law of Moses what he was saying now is even sanctioned in the law of Moses. He says, For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. It, it, is it an oxen God is concerned about? Now back in the old law, this, they would, or, they, or the old times, they would have a stick in the middle and they'd have the ox and so he could walk in the circle. And they're saying, you can't muzzle that ox if he wants to eat so he couldn't you know, eat some of that grain that he was threshing out of the floor there. Um, and we actually have a, you know, the Bible is the best commentary on itself if you look for it. And Paul tells Timothy here that the labor is worthy of his wages is, ba is what that is saying. In other words, if you're doing the work, it's worthy for you to get paid. Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? He says, yes, for our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be a taker, partaker of his hope. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? So... <clears throat> Paul's explaining in these 9 through 11 verses, it is reasonable that preachers should be supported by the brethren, and this was even in the law of Moses. He says, if others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. He's telling them, this appears for that or suggest that this church at Corinth had been supporting other preachers even though they had not been supporting Paul because he would not take anything from them. But some thought that he did not deserve support either. So it's an interesting thought process here I had not considered. But Paul earned his own way as to not be a burden, though he deserved to be paid. So it's all about, you know, 
He still deserved it even though he chose not to take it. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple and those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Again, he's going back to that old law as an example to help them understand his points. The Levites who prepared animals for sacrifice were allowed to partake of the sacrifice. And you can read that in Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. God stipulated that. Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. I don't know, again, if I've ever read that verse before. I do not remember that. But he is plainly saying here, you know, that preachers should be paid and supported by their congregation. But I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things, that it should be done to me. For it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting void. You know, they should, <clears throat> he's saying they should not take my refusal of support to mean that I'm not an apostle and I'm not worthy or I'm unworthy of support or not worthy to be supported. And he's not writing them there in that second line. You can see to say, I want you to you know, support me now. That's not his whole point in this. And he says, I would rather die than to have it said that his work in preaching the gospel and establishing congregation was done for money. It's kind of interesting. I don't know. I heard this term from somebody. Paul was a spiritual entrepreneur. I don't know. Do y'all know what an entrepreneur is? What's an entrepreneur? Self-employed. Maybe, maybe not. Self-employed because it, an entrepreneur is somebody that's, they're not really motivated by money. They're motivated by the vision of whatever they're doing. They're motivated by helping the person they're trying to help or be creative. I remember, um, I think it was, uh, you know, I like, re you know me, I like reading business stuff and success stuff and all, but I remember reading this guy talking about, I think it was Michelangelo, he, he did the Sistine Chapel, right? He lay it on his back, painting the Sistine Chapel, and somebody said something to him about sleeping or being hungry or something. He's like, what is food? What is sleep? I've got to finish this. You know, that was what was important to him. That's the entrepreneurial mindset is you don't do it for money. Now, you keep score by the money. Don't get me wrong. But that's how we keep score. But that's not the motivation. I remember reading about Elon Musk when he was at PayPal in the early days. And he was literally working all the time, taking a little cat nap, getting back up and programming and working and taking the cat nap and programming and working. He wasn't doing it for the money. He was doing it to make the end goal to help people. And I found that interesting. Same thing with Edison. When we went and visited his home down in Florida, he had a little cot there and he would work and he'd lay down, take a cat nap, he'd get back up and work. And he wasn't building his inventions for money. Um, so that's the entrepreneur. And I think Paul's the best example of that spiritual entrepreneur because um, he was not doing anything for money. He was doing it for the Lord. He knew the value of a soul. You know, he supported himself by his own trade during his three missionary journeys. Gifts of the church in Philippi that were given for him were not remuneration, if I can say that, for services rendered, but were tokens of love for Paul. And I think we have to, again, have the love of Christ to do what we do not do it for any other reasons. I know we have a joke in the eldership sometimes. We're like, okay, I vote to double my pay because it's been, we're having a tough time. And, you know, two times zero is still zero, right? We don't do it because of any, you know, we do it because of love of Christ. We do it because of love of you guys is why we do it. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. You know, he's saying this necessity is laid upon him by Jesus Christ to preach the gospel. And we see that in Philippians 3.12. Woe to me, not only <clears throat> could he not glory... 
But it would displease the Lord if he did not do what the Lord had called him to do. I've already talked about the calling, and we're only called by the gospel. Now, I did a whole session on that. Hopefully, y'all recall that. So, um, you know, we're not called directly by God anymore. But this made me think about, you know, in Jeremiah 20, the end of that verse 9, he says, But his word was in my heart like a burning flame, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. And I believe that's what Paul was saying. He says, you know, it's in my heart like a burning flame. I can't hold it back. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. And then we see in Acts 4.20, Peter and John basically saying the same thing before that Sanhedrin says, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Again, the things Paul has seen and heard, what he could do, he could not help but do this. He says, for if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. You know, his personal satisfaction in preaching the gospel without pay, that, I mean, it was his personal satisfaction. That was his reward, not being paid. You know, there's a sense in which Paul did his work of his own will. Another sense in which he did it, did not do it of his own will because the Lord had called him and commanded him to preach the gospel. Um, so, <clears throat> So what is my reward then? That when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge, that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel? You know, what is this reward? He says, not preaching, not just preaching, but doing so without pay. That was his reward. He looked to Christ Jesus for his reward. That's what we need to be looking for, for Christ. Look, keep our goal on heaven. When we take, when, Christ, when Satan gets our goal off of heaven and onto something else, something petty, something that really doesn't matter, you know, it's, we've got to be careful. In 2 Corinthians, which we won't get into, obviously, but Paul tells them there in 11.7, Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? Again, he's reiterating, he did not charge. He was not commanded by Christ to refuse support, but he made this his practice so he could not be accused by his enemies of seeking gain. He did not want the spreading of the gospel to hinder by, be hindered by any suspicions concerning his character. And I think we should you know, applaud this, but you have to remember who Paul was. He was Saul. He was a persecutor of the Christians. How easy would it have been for him to, for people to spread the rumor or say, oh, well, he's just doing this because he's getting paid. He's making more money doing this as he was persecuting the Christians. You know, where he came from, I think, had a lot to do with the reason um, behind this. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. Notice that, win the more. Paul was free. He wasn't bound because he wasn't paid. So that, you know, would bound him to the congregation. He was free from the Jewish hierarchy. He gave up being a Pharisee. He gave up being a part of the Sanhedrin. He was free to go where the Lord directed him to go. Total freedom. He says, I made myself a servant. It is enslaved myself. And we'll see later how some words he uses that really talks about how he did this. Paul promoted the spiritual welfare of others. He did it as a servant, not for the pay he could get. He adjusted himself to the needs of others. And this is what we're going to talk about. And notice, I might win the more. <clears throat> I, and yet indeed, I also count all things lost. Again, he gave up being a Pharisee, he gave up being the Sanhedrin, he gave up a lot, you know, everything basically for Christ, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Again, these worthy things meant nothing that I may gain Christ. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews to those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those who are, un are under the law. Again, his focus was saving souls. He recognized the value of a soul. He practiced the Jewish ceremonies as far as he could without violating New Testament law. We see that in Timothy's circumcision, the Nazarite vow, the purification rites he, that <clears throat> is talked about in Acts 16, 18, and 21. Also, oops, 
He refrained from exercising some of the freedoms he had in Christ to help, the, help other people or save a brother, as in, we read in 8.13, when he said, I would not eat meat. To those who are without law as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without the law. Now, anytime you see that without law, he's referring to the Gentiles here. Same way with uncircumcision is Gentiles. The circumcision is the Jewish people. But it's interesting. <clears throat> the Gentiles were without law, were a written law, but that doesn't mean they were lawless. Remember, we had the patriarchal age, the mosaic age, then you have the Christian age. They basically, when G Jesus took those, the patriarch out, made the, the separate mosaic law, they were still under that patriarchal law, still under the law of God. And this is an interesting play on words I read. It says, Robertson said the Greek construction of that term could actually mean not being an outlaw to God, but an in-law of Christ. He's, <clears throat> it was at the commentary I read on this said, it's a play on words in the Greek that didn't come out in that translation. Um, so I, thought, I just thought that was interesting. To those who are without law, I'm sorry, uh, and another point on that, all men are under the law of God, whether they know it or not. We see that in Romans 7. <clears throat> all men are under the law of Christ, whether they accept it or not. Galatians 6, 2. All men should obey the law of the Spirit. Romans 8, 2. I was listening to some old sermons of Wesley Simon at uh, Tri-City School of Preaching the other days, and he's probably 15 years ago, 20 maybe, when he preached this lesson. But he, he had an Arise to Truth radio program, and people would call in, and he would discuss it, discuss Bible with them. You know, they would ask questions, he'd give them answers. He said this guy called in, he said, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. He says, no, sir. That is not correct. He said, the Bible says it. That settles it, whether you believe it or not. I want you to think about that. How many people do we do not believe and think it, that means it's unsettled or think it doesn't matter? We take, you know, Michael talked about this woman that cut verses out of her Bible with a pen knife because she didn't believe the verse or didn't want to obey the verse. So we have to be careful. The Bible says it, that settles it. It doesn't matter whether we believe it or not. I just thought that was profound and fit right into here. To the weak, I have become as weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Again, saving souls was his priority. That's top of mind with Paul all the time. This Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker with you. This partaker here, again, he's focused on furthering the gospel and saving souls. The partaker, partaker of its promises, partaker of its blessings, which can come from no other source, partaker of eternal life, the crowning purpose of the gospel. 1 Peter 5, 1 says, a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. That's what we have in Christ do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but the one receives the price? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Again, the Isthmus Games happen every two years right outside of Corinth. Somebody, some say eight to ten miles. So you had this huge influx of people like the Olympic Games that we have every four years. Huge influx of people coming. They all understood what he's getting ready to say here about this analogy. Um, about running a race, a physical race, compared to running the Christian race. <clears throat> and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. Temperate, that means self-control in all things, a manner of life. How many of us have self-control in all things? I'm going, to be, I'm going to give a confession here. When we have Sunday fellowship meal, it is hard for me to have self-control and not overeat. <laughs> Especially when Barbara brings, she brings some of her desserts. So, but we have to have self-control. And the athlete wins by denying himself many lawful pleasures. 
I want to reiterate that. That's how an athlete wins, by denying himself many lawful pleasures or pushing themselves to do things they don't feel like doing. When Ezekiel lived with us and he ran track for the college, I remember him going out. It was cold. And this boy's from Kenya. He did not like the cold. And he would go out and run 10 miles. I mean, he did what he needed to do. He was constantly pushing himself and training. And I guess I can relate to that with this. You know, then he, you know, he did whatever it took to win um, for himself. An imperishable crown. Now, these crowns that they got was just a little, you know, olive branch or whatever. It was going to wither. It was going to die. But the Christian crown is the crown of righteousness we see in 2 Timothy. The crown of life in James 1. The crown of glory. A glorious crown in 1 Peter, the crown of rejoicing in 1 Thessalonians that we have. You know, winning is focused on one goal, winning the prize, but victory is not the result of one thing, but many small things. Again, a business example, I remember reading of this, believe it or not, computers used to be as big as this room in the 70s. I know that's hard to comprehend, and it did not have the computing power that you carry around in your pocket. This company in the early 70s, because it was so expensive, they shared computing power, and they all paid to share in this. And there were 200 companies that went together and to share in this computing power at this particular time. And after a year, 191, no, 190 of those companies actually went bankrupt and quit. Nine of those companies survived but was not profitable. One of those companies was profitable. And that company actually ended up selling to another company. And they went back and analyzed it. He said, all of us, you know, we had the same computer. We were sharing in the resources. We were all doing this stuff. What made this one com company profitable and all the rest not profitable of the 199? They decided it was, they couldn't find one thing. He said it was all the little things. Their training manuals were a little bit better. Their everything was just a tiny bit better. It was not one thing. And that's the same way it is with everything. And we, you know, it's like us. <clears throat> Who was it yesterday? Marshall, I think it was, says, many hands make the work light, right? Because we, all the guys were in there, you know, washing dishes, cleaning, doing stuff, you know, working to, to help. It was a lot of people involved in yesterday. It wasn't one person, so it wasn't that big of a burden. But again, thank you to the Lamberts for doing all that. I know they did the bulk of the work. So, but, um, so it's many small things like that with us. All of us doing a little bit. It's amazing what can get accomplished. And we have to be, again, focused on that imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. Unclearly might be a better translation of that uncertainty there. And this phrase, beat the air, could refer to two things. It could be a boxer who punches into the air in order to train, or it could be describing a situation where his adversary evades his blow, causing him to waste his effort and strength. So he's in the fight, punching and the guy ducks and he evades the blow or he's training so this could be either one of those again i remember teaching a book in the high school classes using football analogy it says when you were in class when you were in worship this is like the practice field the game is out there and we have to remember that. When we go out of these doors, that's when we're playing the Christian game. It's not when we're in here. We're practicing right now. Okay, so it's a, it's a mind thing. So, but we've got to train. We've also got to be in the fight and playing the game. But I discipline my, my body to bring it into subjection lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. And this is the verse I spent quite a bit of time on the phone with Charles back in the early 2000s when I was discussing this with a gentleman. You know, he beat, I, this, this discipline means to beat black and blue, to knock out, to render senseless to temptation. That's the severity that Paul's talking about in self-discipline that we need to do to ourselves. 
Bring into subjection, treat it as a slave rather than be enslaved by it. Why I myself should be disqualified? What does this mean? In studying this, I look at a lot of commentaries. It's interesting, the expository Bible commentaries, one I've got on my app. The once saved, always saved people say, E.F. Harrison says, disqualified, the term is found twice in RSV in 1 Corinthians 9.27, gradochemos, I guess how you say that, not standing the test, a castle way, rejected. Paul expresses concern that he keep his body disciplined lest he forfeit the prize in the Christian race. You know, that really sounds pretty good. But then he goes on to say, he is not contradicting Chapter 3, verse 15 in 1 Corinthians, where salvation itself is the issue for the theme, and 9 through 27 is not salvation per se, but a reward for the service of Christ. Again, this false doctrine is out there in commentaries, and we have to be careful when we're reading commentaries to discern truth from error. This disqualified. Now, World Video Bible School says... Disqualified, unable to stand the test. Doesn't that sound just like what we read? Worthless, counterfeit, retrobate. Having offered eternal life to others by preaching, he may lose his own salvation by not keeping his body enslaved to righteousness. And I thought I had, I didn't put six, um, 16 on here, but I thought I had it pulled up, but I do not. In verse 6, 16 says... Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. So, you've got to be enslaved to righteousness. All of the contestants, again, he's speaking to these people who understood the athletic games. In these ancient athletic games had to have proof that they had undergone extensive training for 30 days prior to the actual games they had to attend exercises at the gymnasium to fulfill all conditions before they were allowed to enter the games if they failed in one qualification they were disqualified notice they weren't even allowed to participate if you can't participate there is no way to win the prize they are totally disqualified unable to stand the test is what he's referring to here in fact first Corinthians 15 1 and 2 he will later say moreover brethren I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you which also you received and in which you stand uh -oh, that messed up on that slide um, but that received there is the same as in Acts 2.41. It means they were baptized into Christ as in verse 38, by which you are saved. If, I mentioned before, these little if words are powerful. You hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. That is useless. Might as well not have believed that little if world means you are lost again. Second Peter 2.20 20 and 21 for if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter is worse to them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Again, they've turned away from God. They are lost. For it is impossible. Now, this is apostasy which is a little bit different, but it's still, I think it's still applicable and relevant. For those who were once enlightened have tasted the heavenly gift, have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tested, tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Once saved, always saved, does not work. And we have to be careful of false doctrine. I know that was the second bell. We will start with 1 Corinthians chapter 10 next week. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, come see me later and we will try to answer them at the next class also. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.